I'm one of those people who believes that it's the wrong narrative to try to sell Bitcoin as a, as a threat to the US dollar or a replacement to the US dollar, because if we want mass adoption, that's not the way to sell it to the people who are still in charge of some of this regulatory framework. So I think we have a long way to go. And I think we just we need to remind people that this is a savings technology. It's a computer network. It's an emerging technology that everyone should embrace. That's not threatening. It's not political. It's not it's something that could potentially help every single person. And I truly believe that in the end, Bitcoin is the one thing that I think could rise out of the ashes. Some of us get more fervent and like, you know, animated than others. But like at the core of it is is virtue and it's hope and it's this excitement for kind of reworking the mess that was created with good intentions most of it right like the road to hell was paved with great intentions and all these people probably had good intentions going into office and it's just unfortunately it's turned into a giant mess and bitcoin fixes this i truly believe that Hey everyone, thanks for watching this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you like and comment below. And to find future episodes in your feed and push notifications, make sure you subscribe. And if you click the little bell, you'll get every new episode as it's released. Thanks again for watching. Natalie Brunel is a reporter, an educator, and a Bitcoiner. Over the past year, Natalie has gone down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and has completely refocused her professional life on Bitcoin with her podcast, Coin Stories. In today's conversation, we talk about Natalie's career in broadcast journalism, how the industry has changed, and how she hopes to help Bitcoin. So let's dive in with the one and only Natalie Brunel. Hey guys, I'm going to take a quick pause to introduce the first sponsor on The Jay Gould Show. I am happy and proud to say that this show is now sponsored by Witham Smith & Brown, which is a forward-thinking, technology-driven advisory and accounting firm that is committed to helping big and small companies be more profitable, efficient, and productive in today's complex business environment. Witham now also has a dedicated crypto and blockchain technology team to help early-stage businesses properly navigate all the crypto tax-related matters. I've been using with them both personally and professionally for nearly a decade for all of my businesses, personal needs as well. I'm very happy with them and I highly recommend with them. You can contact with them by visiting their website at with them.com. Now back to the show. Natalie, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. So first question I ask everybody who's come on the show, tell me five people that you're surrounding yourself with the most these days. Um, kind of you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with. So who are you talking to professionally these days? Oh gosh. I mean, I just try to surround myself with Bitcoiners who are smarter than me, who I learn from. And that list is much bigger than five, but I guess I'll just <laughs> uh, name the first five that come to mind who I'm just constantly absorbing their information online. And that would be Michael Saylor, Preston Pish, Jeff Booth, Lynn Alden, and, um, you know, I love Pomp. Pomp's got some good stuff with his show. So, And you've interviewed all these people, I think, so far, right? I've interviewed them all. And yeah, I've been very fortunate to get all of their stories. So I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, they even know who I am at this point and uh, that I get to learn from them, like I said, because you could go down the rabbit hole for, I think, a decade and longer. I mean, you just, there's constantly new information. And with the, the environment that we're in right now in the, in the markets, I think, you know, everything's constantly changing and there's more and more to learn and discuss. So yeah, it keeps you busy. We're going to dive into um, that whole, you know, you jumping into Bitcoin and your rabbit hole. But before we do that, I actually want to go back to where you grew up, socioeconomic kind of background. What did your parents do for a living? Where are you from? Let's kind of go through who's Natalie. Where are you from? Sure. So I was born in Poland and my parents grew up in a communist country. My mom wanted to come to the United States ever since she was very young. Her dad was the one that would tell her about how life was better in the States. You know, you should try to get over there. And she would watch Hollywood movies and had, I think, this very you know, uh, optimistic Pollyanna like view of what life in America could be. So she had this really vivid American dream that she wanted to pursue, but it was very hard to come. You had to essentially win like a visa lottery. And so my mom would apply and apply and apply. And it was always a no. And it wasn't until she was 38 years old and my dad was 41 when they finally had the chance to immigrate. And it was really interesting just hearing their stories because my dad at that point, you know, life wasn't amazing. I mean, it was just uh, that they 
no one had as much as someone who's wealthy here in the U.S. in Poland. Everything was a little bit more equalized and everyone had it a little bit rough, uh, especially after communism. Um, and uh, so my dad just thought, you know, we are we're comfortable. We know what, what life is like here. We know what to expect. Why would we move and start over? We don't know the language. It's going to be really tough. And my mom was the one that really dug her heels in. And she said, I want my kids to get an American education. They'll have more opportunity. There's more upward mobility. So we need to do it. At this point, it's not about us anymore. It's about them. So my brother or my mom was the brave one. She basically was like, I'm taking, you know, Natalie and, and my brother and you're coming with me or you're not. And so my dad's <laughs> like, okay, I'm coming. And uh, they started over, which I admire so much. I mean, not many people would, would do that. And, uh, and, you know, I didn't, I pr- was probably among the, the families who had the least in, in our neighborhood. My family moved out to a suburb where there were really good schools. So there were some beautiful houses and kids that had a lot of money, definitely upper or middle class. And we had this tiny apartment where my parents slept on the sofa bed and my brother and I had separate rooms because we had such an age difference. So my mom wanted us to have like a sense of normalcy with our own bedrooms and they slept on a pullout couch. And so wow. my idea of someone being rich rich at that time was if you had a garage, because I would see my dad go out at like four o'clock in the morning to scrape the car from the snow and ice in Chicago. And I was like, someday I'm going to have a house with a garage so that my husband doesn't have to do that. <laughs> and uh, so it's just really funny thinking about my my life back then. But I, yeah, my parents were amazing. They really instilled me with this drive to, to um to work hard and get a good education. They told me that education would propel me in life. So I was always a very, very, I was a very good kid. I did not like go out. I was like a total nerd, a study bug. Yeah. And I dreamt of just a, a, a life where I don't have to worry so much because finances were always, um, they always weren't the easiest thing in my family. So. You know, that's a common thread for a lot of people I bring on entrepreneurs on the show and stuff. And it's like, they, they had some kind of childhood, not trauma per se, but like something that motivated them financially. So did you dream of like wealth when you were a kid? Like I want to have more for safety and security. Like, is that something that was on your mind? It wasn't so much wealth. I just, I was a big dreamer. Like I just wanted a sense of security. So my dream was always a house with just kind of the American dream, quintessential like house Mm -hmm. with the white picket fence and you know, being able to take your family on vacation and so, something that to me kind of seems simple, almost like the quintessential middle class life that I think was pretty easy to acquire once in the United States. Um, and I just always felt like I wanted to do something where I, I wanted to learn, constantly learn. Like if, if if someone asked me, like, what's your favorite hobby or activity? I, w- I would say learning. So I loved the idea of becoming a journalist because you can meet people from all different backgrounds. And I saw people, I would look up to people like Barbara Walters and Diane Sawyer who were in interviewing, you know, world leaders and celebrities. And they got to have a job that I thought was so noble and so interesting and that would expose me to all these different, you know, opportunities. So um, I was just a big dreamer. I wanted to be successful, but not necessarily wealthy, if that makes sense. And my parents were great though. Like I'm, I'm really lucky in the sense that I think, you know, some people I've met throughout my life and career uh, they also financially struggled, but you know, someone got into drugs or alcohol or there were issues along the way. And like my parents were just hardworking, salt of the earth, good people who, you know, went to church and told me I had to be a good person because nothing matters if I'm not good to other people and we're all connected in this world. And so I'm just really grateful because they, I think they led by, by shining example. So the journalism thing is interesting. I think I told you that before we jumped on, <clears throat> I sold my company to a broadcast company, Nextstar Media, actually. And um, so I, I kind of have a sense of how those companies operate. You had dreamed about doing that, and then you went down that path, and you and you did do it. Why did you leave? Like, what what about it made you want to leave, and why did you br- branch off on your own now? I mean, I guess today you don't need to be within the big companies. You could do it just like you're doing right now. Um, tell me, tell me that experience. Like, what, why you dreamt about doing? We talked about, but then taking the leap and and leaving. That's a big leap. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because I, 
I've met so many fellow immigrant families and people, and my mom wanted me to become a doctor or a lawyer, like something that's, you know, very predictable and the financial security is pretty much guaranteed. Whereas with journalism, it's just, it's not necessarily. However, I will say, you know, when I was dreaming about becoming a newscaster, you know, this was 90s, early 2000s, it was a, it was a pretty nice career path. Even if you were a local anchor, you were making pretty good money. You had a pretty good position in your, in your community. And so I thought that that's, you know, what I was going to pursue. And my mom always told me like, if, even if it's one in a million, that could be Oprah or Barbara Walters, someone has to be that one. And it, it could be you just go for it, go for it. So, um, so I went down that path and I, I set my sights on getting into the, the media world. And I was very confident that I could, I could succeed. Um, but social media and technology changed everything. I mean, it really like turned my career on its head. And it's the one thing where I, I now teach at a journalism school. And I wish I had that crystal ball at the time, because essentially today it's much more marketable and profitable and um, I think useful to have an expertise within journalism. So go to law school, go to medical school, go to business school, and then use that to spread information as opposed to being sort of this, you know, jack of all trades where you just focus on journalism and you report a little bit on everything, but you're never really an expert and you never go very deep on a topic. Um, I didn't expect for social media to drive our business and and also change its financial structure because now it was like, you know, I, I went into school, all of a sudden I I'm shooting the video, I'm editing the video, I'm doing the job of five people, but I'm being paid less than the person who got to do just one of those jobs. And, and so that was like a real wake up call after the financial crisis. This was at the media company. They made you do some of that work too. You had to do that. Oh yeah. So I basically entered as the transition was happening. Cause it was basically, I mean, if, so I was in school in the early two thousands, graduated college in 2009. And that was just as like Facebook and Instagram and all of these platforms were taking off. And the idea of citizen journalism and YouTube was starting to bubble up. But I didn't, you know, I, we didn't have the foresight. My, my professor certainly didn't. I still was on sort of that traditional path. And it, uh, yeah, it changed so quickly. So my first jobs, I was being paid, you know, like thirty thousand dollars a year, and I was the camera person, the producer, the editor, the wow. li like everything, all of it. <sighs> yeah, uh, and and you know, a job that looks very glamorous on TV. It's a yeah, they, lot they don't make it hard to leave. <laughs> it's a <laughs> right? lot of hard work. Yeah. So, um, so to make a long story short, you know, I did. I, I did really the old school path of journalism. I, I went and got my grad degree and then I started in a tiny market. I started in Palm Springs, California. I was a cub reporter and just, you know, grinding my teeth as, as a reporter and an anchor in multiple cities and markets. And I saw, I feel like what's facing our nation on a micro level every single day. I was sort of in the trenches reporting on all of these things that now we talk about on a macro level, especially with Bitcoin, of poverty, homelessness, public corruption, mm. you know, the general state of the American life decreasing. And, it, and it's harder and harder to afford things like education and housing. And I'm seeing these stories in like every little person that I interview that I do these like mini packages on for TV. And so I started to think, you know, God, there's something wrong here. You know, and my family had worked so, so, so hard for about um, the first almost, almost uh, about 15 years since coming here. We came in 1991 and then the financial bubble erupted in 2008. And my family had just been able to afford a house, a mortgage, and the bubble popped and we lost everything and they filed for bankruptcy. And it was like, just as we had made it to like a small version of the American dream, we lost all of it. And so I had this, I think, predisposition of distrust in the system. Like something's wrong, something's rigged. I don't understand. And it really doesn't matter who's in office because we've had red, we've had blue, and yet everything continues to deteriorate. And so it wasn't until I learned about Bitcoin that I connected all of the dots of what I had been reporting on, what my own family experienced, and seeing that all of it is connected to our broken money system and inflation, and this idea of money printing, creating a disproportionate access to capital that creates more and more wealth inequality. And it was like the light bulb went off for me. And there was nothing else I needed to dedicate my, like, this is, this is who I am. This is like everything I represent. What, what year was that? When did you start to like see that? When, when, first of all, what, what was your first introduction to hearing about Bitcoin versus when you like go down the, you know, proverbial rabbit hole? <laughs> like when, when, when were those two different, it wasn't right away, right? 
So I learned about Bitcoin in 2017. I was uh, at a local market working in Sacramento, California. I would go to San Francisco on my weekends because I was dating a guy there and his friends had Mount Gox, like had lost money in Mount Gox and they were talking about Bitcoin. And I was like, what the heck is this Bitcoin thing? <laughs> and uh, so that was prior to the to the bull run where it ran up to 20,000. It was probably around, I don't know, three or 4,000 when I heard about it. I bought at 6,000. I was curious enough where I was like, there's something going on with this. And I feel like people in Silicon Valley always know what's up. They certainly knew what was up before <laughs> before I did in my industry. So I don't want to miss out on this. Um, so I started to buy and then I pitched it as a story. I, I'll never forget. I, I told my, my news station, I because we got to pitch original stories as reporters. And I said, let's do a story about Bitcoin. You know, this is interesting. This is technology. And they were just, they thought I was kind of cuckoo, I think. They let me do one story about a Bitcoin ATM that it was in a local Sacramento mall. And that was the only story I was able to do. They were so worried that I was basically pitching some financial product to, like all, the shilling. Old, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. to all the old people that are watching, you know, that, they, that we're going <laughs> to lose them all their money and then they're going to come after us. Um, so yeah, so I did one story and then I, but I didn't go down the rabbit hole. Like I didn't, I, sure. I didn't even know what I bought and that didn't happen until 2019 into 2020. Yeah. Like have you, have you met American Hoddle? You, you know American Hoddle yet? I, I, I know him. I follow him. I haven't met him. You should definitely, I got to introduce you. He, he should be on your show for sure. Okay. Yeah. He's like Mr. Bitcoin. <laughs> um, but he says the same thing. He's like, you know, most people, including himself, and uh, I just interviewed uh, Plan B this morning, and Plan B, same thing. It's like the, the 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 it's like multiple touches, basically, right? The rule of seven in marketing. It's kind of like that with Bitcoin. It takes a couple of times. I think Plan B said he, he he like learned about it in 2013, but it took like another year or two before he. I think 2015 or 16 is when he started buying it. So it took a while for him to buy it too. That says that that, that you're a good company, right? <laughs> when when you realize. It's a great point because, I mean, this is why I've sort of made it my mission to try to help educate people because I know what it feels like to to miss out or to not get it right away and, yeah. and to need a little bit of help and, and a push. And it's it's like this is this is something that to me is so virtuous and has so much opportunity for good that I want everyone to know about it. We all win if, if Bitcoin wins. And um, – it's just hard because it does take so much work, really, to understand it. You have to peel back the layers on why our current system's broken. Otherwise, you yeah. really don't appreciate it. I mean, I was just watching the video of you know Joe Rogan uh, speaking with his guest, and they mentioned Bitcoin. And I mean, Joe Rogan, I, I love Joe Rogan. I think he's so open, and I love how curious he is on all these different topics. And I know he's accepted Bitcoin before, and he's talked about Bitcoin a little bit when he's had like Peter Schiff on his podcast. But he even like his guest said, oh, Bic the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum is Bitcoin's just 21 million and there's no CEO and Ethereum's different. And he he's like, oh, really? Like he doesn't, he still doesn't know. I mean, so many people don't know because they just haven't done the homework and, you know, we need to help them along because there's, there's a lot of, you know, growth. This is a perfect opportunity for me to ask you, Natalie, what, what, if you tell people which books do you recommend in like the order yeah. in which they should read the books, what do you think those, you know, the first three books or the first three things they should try to consume uh, to, to learn about Bitcoin? Yeah. So number one by far for me is Bitcoin standard. That's what truly changed my life. And I, I don't think that I would be in this career transition if I hadn't read the Bitcoin standard. So um, that is number one for me. I also love uh, the fiat standard because it just goes a little bit more in depth on our current system and it peels back the layers on things that touch all of our lives, like our food system and um, even just you know money that we give overseas, hoping to help other countries and how that all works. Uh, so, so those two, I would say, are absolute must. And then, um, like right now on my on my coffee table is also the bullish case for Bitcoin by BJ Boyapati, which I think is incredible. Layered money by Nick Batia, and actually, I'm going to throw out a, a zinger: Peter Schiff's book, The Real Crash. <laughs> And I, he's anti Bitcoin, but that man he doesn't is, know he's really not. <laughs> he is a wealth of like Austrian economic historic information, and his views are so in line with what we believe about government and freedom yeah. and hard money. And so, his book, The Real Crash, for me was also a must read. I'm gonna have to check that out. I haven't, I haven't read that. It's great. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I always say if you take the word uh, gold and replace it with Bitcoin when he's talking, he's basically just talking about. Bitcoin. Absolutely. <laughs> he, just, he just hung up on the physicality of it, I think. And it's like, he's got to get over that. Um, 
So in, in your opinion, what is the most attractive attribute of Bitcoin? And you've mentioned a lot, but like, what do you think like the top two things out of all the different, you know, what, what's your number two things that you would say? Yeah. I mean, I, I sometimes say this on my news hits. I think the two most attractive qualities are the scarcity, number one, and then the decentralization. So I love the fact that this is like, inf it's, it's non-inflationary or disinflationary, if you will. And I didn't realize until I learned about Bitcoin how many problems over millennia have happened to empires and countries because of inflation and monetary expansion and how much that ultimately hurts the people in the middle and the people at the bottom. Um, so I would say the fact that there's only going to be 21 million and it's this like uh, insurance policy against the big banking system and central authority and then the decentralization aspect. And so sort of the idea that this technology is like the internet, there's no central point of failure. It's essentially bomb proof. There's no there's no one in control. There's no CEO. There's no president. There's no language. There's no air, you know, barriers to entry. I think that's so powerful and incredible. It's unlike any other coin in that in that way. And I just think it has the ultimate potential to become, if if not if not something transactional, at least our global reserve asset and sort of that ultimate store of value and savings technology. So one thing I, like, I liked about VJ, I had him on a few weeks ago, and. Um, his his by the way his paper that he wrote is amazing and the book is just an expanded version of that so yeah. I tell people all the time just read the medium it's it's like a for, shorter version of the book um, and anybody can do that that that's simple uh, but even his book is pretty short actually and uh, I always say like you know Safedine's book's a little harder I think for your first read maybe read VJ's book first and then read the Bitcoin Standard it kind of get, gets you up their curve a little bit I think um, but what I what I really liked about his book is that most Bitcoiners the Maxis right we're friends with these people like they don't really like talk about risks in Bitcoin. Bitcoin, but there are risks, right? And he talks about risks in his book. What do you find to be the biggest risk to Bitcoin in the short term? Yeah, so I mean, it's it's very volatile. Obviously, we're seeing a drop that's that could that could have hurt some people if they put in yeah, sure. too much or if they used leverage. Uh, so I think people need to have a strong stomach when it comes to that volatility and not necessarily put in something that they need to use in the next, let's say, four years or so. The thing I'm most concerned about that hurts volatility is essentially what the Fed's going to do, because I think we're in a yes. historic time right now. I mean, they have printed so much money to the point that this house of cards, I mean, they're talking about raising rates and the market just just drops. It can't handle even the conversation of it. It's so fragile. Bitcoin is so liquid and it's so easy for people to just, you know, pull right out of it. And I'm worried about the next 10 years because I think that, you know, if we don't want inflation, they're going to have to raise rates and start QT. And Bitcoin's only really existed in a QE environment. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of, it, it's grown in, in a in monetary expansion. And now, in order to get a grip on inflation, they're going to try to tighten, but tightening could crash the market. And so yeah. there's there's this sort of like, you know, they're in they're between a rock and a hard place, and either direction is is horrible, right? Inflation's going to hurt everybody, especially the people who can't afford the the prices increasing. Um, a stock market crash that 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 can't happen on any politician's watch, right? So, like, what's going to happen? And I think because Bitcoin's so new and it's so volatile, it's going to be along for a really crazy ride. And I do think it's like that that safety vessel, that life raft. But a lot of people don't know about it yet. Um, you know, we don't. Ha it hasn't necessarily proven itself over time yet when it comes to mass adoption and mass trust. And I just wonder what's going to happen with Fed policy over the next couple of years and what bonds yep. are going to do and whether we're going to go into this maybe hyperinflationary environment. Will will someone be like a Volcker that steps in? You know, I I truly believe in the long run, Bitcoin will experience hyper Bitcoinization and we will hit, you know, the high digits and people will run to it. But I just think it's going to take some time and there's going to be hurdles because our system is so leveraged and we're on the brink of potentially a credit collapse if the if they, if they something goes in the wrong direction, you know? I, I've been saying this all year. I'm glad you say this because a lot of people don't share the view, actually. Uh, maybe they're just burying their head in the sand. I don't know. But the Fed controls the old saying, you can't fight the Fed, right? They control everything. And so r rates, uh, everything is based off of the risk-free rate. And uh, when I mentioned this, I guess I'm on Clubhouse a bunch. When I mentioned this on Clubhouse like six plus months ago, the Bitcoin friends would just start yelling at me 
Bitcoin doesn't care about the Fed. I'm like, Bitcoin may not care about the Fed, but the people who own Bitcoin do. (laughs) So it's it's a real risk. I think it's a real risk. And um, I don't think it kills Bitcoin, to your point. Uh, but if you got in at 69,000 at the top, you, it might take a while if that this happens now and continues on, it could be a while. Right. I mean, so I tell people ease your way into Bitcoin, right. Over time, just, just slowly buy into it. That's, that's probably the best, best way to kind of mitigate that risk. Cause you, you don't know, you don't want to try to time a bottom or a top and put it all in at once. Just buy in over time. Right. And we'll see what the fed does. Who knows? I know. Well, I mean, that's really the question because if they raise rates, some of this debt will be completely not serviceable. And yeah. like, where do we go from here? Right. I mean, we, we can't, can we get to 10% inflation? Can we, can we handle a 2% rate rate hike? I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I think that I think we can, I was talking to plan B about this, Natalie. And he was saying that like before last year, the rates were basically yeah. 2%. And now yeah. they're re, now the 10 year is not that it's the yeah. overnight rate, mm-hmm. but the 10 years up to like 1.8, he said, and on earlier last year, I was talking with Preston. Um, we were on Clubhouse a bunch, right? In the mornings yeah. and stuff. And we would talk about this. And like, no Bitcoiners were talking about rates, but me and Preston yeah. were, because we're more macro, you know? And yeah, we're talking yeah. about the macro. Yeah. And, and it's like, at the end of the day, we went from like 0. 0.9, 90 basis points up to 1.5. And that was worrying the shit out of me. And it was really worrying Preston, not worrying for any long term capabilities of what's going to happen to Bitcoin. But the short, it could, I said, I think what's going to cause, the bear market for this, what's going to push us into the Bitcoin bear is probably the Fed. And here we are. They started tapering. They're accelerating it. They're talking about raising rates in a couple of months. And here we are, you know? And I do I do think it's definitely going to go to 2%. I definitely think that eventually people will capitulate and say, okay, well, we can handle this. But we're just kicking the can down the road ultimately. That's it. I mean, at some point, this thing is going to collapse. The legs are going to be kicked out from under it. And and unfortunately, Bitcoin will go down with it. It's, it is correlated to massive swings like this. And again, it's easy to drain liquidity from it. And people will be yanking out money at, from any direction if, if we you know correct 20% or even worse, like some strategies strategists are predicting who I've I've interviewed on my show and I ultimately though like long term I think Bitcoin wins at this point because we've just unfortunately taken it too far in the direction of inflation and debasing our currency. And I'm one of those people who believes that it's the wrong narrative to try to sell Bitcoin as a as a threat to the U.S. dollar or a replacement to the U.S. dollar because if we want mass adoption, that's not the way to sell it to the people who are still in charge of some of this regulatory framework right. and some of these hurdles that we need to overcome for mass adoption. People have their entire savings in cash, cash equivalents, bonds, you know, things that we, we, we're, they're not even allowed to hold Bitcoin in some of these, you know, traditional um, avenues. And so I think we have a long way to go. And I think we just, we need to remind people that this is a savings technology. It's a computer network. It's an emerging technology that everyone should embrace. That's not threatening. It's not political. It's not, it's something that could potentially help every single person. And I truly believe that in the end, when all of this shakes out, and I do think we're going to have a lot of rough waters ahead when all of this shakes out, Bitcoin is the one thing that I think could rise out of the ashes and save us from some of this. So um, I don't know what that world looks like and how we get there, but like, I, I, it does bring me hope because I will say that over the 10 years of reporting on all of these crises and all of these issues ballooning, 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 I had very little hope before I learned about Bitcoin. I just kind of started to become this jaded reporter who was like, every year I'm going to cover homelessness getting worse, uh, more money being spent, some new guy getting elected who promises to make a difference but ends up getting rich himself. It, and it's just it's just like cyclical and everyone's infighting because no one can even picture something outside of this current system that we've built. No one can no one sees the garden outside of our walls. And Bitcoin is this fertile land that we can like plant a new world order on. And and the Bitcoiners see it, right? So like we're like come on guys, like come with us. And like some of us get more fervent and like, you know, animated than others. But like at the core of it is, is virtue and it's hope. And it's this excitement for kind of reworking the mess that was created with good intentions, most of it, right? Like the road to hell was paved with great intentions and all these people probably had good intentions going into office. And it's just, unfortunately, it's turned into a giant mess and Bitcoin fixes this. I truly believe that. So you obviously know CJ, right? So like CJ and M are working on, yeah. So they're working in DC and it's like, that is so needed, right? Because I, what I, what I fear is that Bitcoin becomes another wedge issue for one side or the other. We need to be on both sides where they're in acceptance of Bitcoin 
we can't make this a wedge issue that it's the Republicans only versus the Democrats. You know, that that's not going to work for for us in Bitcoin, right? So hopefully they're doing a pretty good job at that. And I think, and if, if I know anything about CJ, he's probably doing a good job at that with, with uh, Jimmy and all them. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, now that you and I follow each other on Instagram, because we follow each other over there, I, I could see that you're really putting yourself out there. You've been going to these different places. You were in Dubai, I think, recently, and yeah. you're kind of like all over the place. Um, I will say, you're the complete opposite of me. You're, you're extroverted. I'm totally introverted. <laughs> I do it from my bar downstairs, <laughs> you know, my show. But you're like flying around. I think you told me you had to postpone the, the interview because you were going to meet with uh, Lynn, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, Is that yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. That, that went well, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's so funny because I used to travel for news work and it was always going to the most miserable locations for the most tragic stories. Like it was like a natural disaster or a mass shooting or something horrible happened somewhere. And I had to, you know, get up in the middle of the night, get my bag together and like fly somewhere, stay in some remote area and probably a horrible hotel or motel. And now it's like I get to fly to beautiful countries and and go to meet with the biggest thought leaders in Bitcoin and talk to them about a technology that I think could change the world and like help bank the unbanked and like offer a, a generational wealth strategy to people. And I'm like, wow, I'm so grateful because it's not lost on me how, how fortunate I am to have gotten to this position or this uh, area in my career. I've worked very, very hard, hard for it. And I'm very, very grateful. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, like, you're now, you're like an entrepreneur, basically. Now you're on your own, so you're not on a schedule. So what does your day look like when you wake up? What do you, what does your day look like these days? How are you managing your day? For a lot of people, it's very difficult. For me, I've always done it my whole whole career, actually. So it's just like old hat now. It's like, it, I have a pattern. What are you doing? Wake, wake me up. Tell me what Natalie does. You wake up in the morning. What's your day like? Yeah, that's funny. I've never been asked that. Um, so every day looks very, very different. But in general, I wake up very early. So I'll wake up by five or six. I meditate a little. I have my morning coffee and I like to just center myself. And then I start watching or listening to some of the latest uh, Bitcoin information, whether it's a podcast or a show or something that came out from the the Fed. I read up on the latest articles. And I always did that when I had my news job too. When I got down the rabbit hole, I would spend basically from like six o'clock in the morning until nine-ish just consuming information and just getting more up to date. And then right around nine o'clock, my calls start. So whether the, that's me being on an interview or me be, me interviewing someone for my podcast, um, the calls generally start then. Uh, I work on my podcast some days. I'm either booking guests or editing an episode or you know trying to research questions for who I'm going to interview. Uh, now I'm doing some video content for Bitcoin Magazine. Um, I'm working on uh, a show that will come out soon that, that I'm really excited about. That's it's a little bit more news driven. Um, I appear on some news shows as a commentator. I do I've seen that a bunch. Yeah. yeah. So every day is a little bit different and it's a little hectic, but it's so much fun. I wish I had more hours in the day to even consume the information because I just, you know, I don't have a tech or a finance background. So I feel like I'm coming I, I have the skills of being a messenger, I guess, or a communicator. And so I'm trying to take those skills and focus them on how to best simplify the message of Bitcoin to the masses. Like that's what I feel like is my mission, so to speak, and my calling now. But, you know, that requires me to be very, very um, knowledgeable about Bitcoin and economics and be able to sort of translate that message into something that most people can understand. So that's what I work on every single day because I don't, you know, I'm not like safe and I don't have a PhD in engineering or economics. I wish I did. I'm trying to get mine online. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's my every day is different. Well, I, the fact that you're a female in Bitcoin, because tech in general is underappreciated from females, right? We don't have enough females in, in tech. So it's great the fact that we have somebody that came from traditional media that is a female that's in tech. I think that's great for for Bitcoin because you could draw more females into it because they identify with you. So I think that's awesome. Um, and the fact that you're going on mainstream media still, because you probably have old contacts there, right? So you're able to get on television and stuff. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah, no, I hope to do more of it. Like they need to call us more. They need to call the Bitcoiners more because they don't really cover the topic as much as I think they should. Yeah, they just called Jason and Pomp. <laughs> And you, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but you're on you're on Fox. I saw you on Fox. I don't know. You were somewhere else. Where are you on, Katie? No, where I saw you somewhere else recently. Um, yeah, I've done some Fox business hits. I've done some local news hits. Um, I'm going to be on a couple of other shows this week. So I'm just really excited. Like anyone that calls me, I really want to make the time to do it because again, I just think that there's such a knowledge gap. There's such an information gap. Mm -hmm. And also I'm trying to kind of hopefully educate the the media members, the, the producers and the anchors that, you know, everyone lumps Bitcoin in with cryptocurrency, which is sort of yeah. frustrating. Like I understand why they do it. And I 
understand that there's just like a lot of... Why do they do it? I don't understand it. Because you'll be on there talking about Bitcoin and they're showing Ethereum on, on a chart. And I'm like, what, what are they doing? <laughs> because, you know, crypto and blockchain, they like place it all under the same umbrella, even though I, I view all of the other projects as essentially like... Pr- technology projects or technology companies that will ultimately be securities. And I don't know which will survive and which won't, but Bitcoin Mm -hmm. fixes this very, very specific problem. And Bitcoin is so unique in so many ways. And it's hard to, it's hard to just get them to stop talking about crypto in general, right? Because I just, I don't think that's the right message. And I think that Bitcoin should be kind of separated from all of that. Uh, So even, you know, I went to Dubai, I went to a blockchain conference and here I am, you know, I'm affectionately now called a Bitcoin maxi, whether, you know, sometimes I guess it's a negative term now, but they're talking about NFTs and metaverse and this and that. And it's, you know, I, I, you know, I wish people luck with their projects. And if you want to be all about your JPEG of a bored ape or whatever, cool. But it's just, I mean, it's not even in the same wheelhouse as Bitcoin. So I don't, you know, I, I try to steer the conversation, but it's hard because so many people just don't have that core knowledge um, and they don't go past the idea of, well, what's the appreciation? Well, this one outperformed Bitcoin last year. And did it. And it's like, well, can we, just, can we talk about economic theory? Can we talk about what the Fed's doing? Can we talk? Because it doesn't matter with these meme coins at, at some point. And with Bitcoin, all of, all of it matters. Like everything that the employment numbers matter, the supply chain issues matter, like all of it's tied into what we're trying to fix with Bitcoin. And people are just talking about the metaverse. <laughs> <I> just like, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Facebook. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've been re- interviewed a bunch of people so far. Um, very impressed uh, what, what you've accomplished so far. Um, can you tell me of the people that you've interviewed, who's the most impressive person that you've had sat down with in Bitcoin? Oh, gosh. I, that's so hard. It's so many people. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, Lynn Alden, who I got to sit down with again last week, is just, her mind's incredible. I wish that I had one hundredth of her brain. I mean, she's just, she could talk for hours about the macro picture and Bitcoin and Fed policy and inflation and the global markets. And it's just, I I just want to learn from her. I I try to consume everything that she does. Um, Preston Pish was awesome. Michael Saylor, super impressive. And I sort of, I watch how he talks about Bitcoin because again, I just think he's so smart in how he captures the the mm. message of, of how Bitcoin can help the majority of people. Um, you know, VJ, VJ story, we talked about bullish case for Bitcoin. His We're both immigrants. So hearing his background and how he worked for Google and how he worked, he tried to get into politics because he thought it would make a difference. And he realized that the whole system's so messed up that <laughs> he could probably change the world more through Bitcoin than any sort of political campaign. Um, no, everyone, I know it's a cheesy answer, but like everyone's just been so fascinating. And I'm, I've been really grateful to, to talk to all of them. Hong, my last interview, OKCoin, okay she's fascinating. Her dad worked for the central bank in China. And so she has this very interesting juxtaposition of, you know, central banking from China and then coming here to the U.S. and now leading a global exchange. And so all fascinating. And everyone comes from this different background and comes to Bitcoin in a different way, but ultimately sees the same opportunity and the same conclusion. And it's just so interesting to peel back those layers. Yeah, they do. But it's like for everybody I've noticed, there there seems to be a different thing that they're most like focused on there's because there's so many different things you you can be some it's like freedom some it's just the, it's a hedge like it just depends on where their background is and what's important to them i've noticed you know yep and i don't know where do you think where do you think uh, michael saylor uh, shakes out as the importance of bitcoin because it seems like you know eric i have eric come on my show in a couple i think it's a few days from now um who orange pilled him and, and he was he was very dismissive of Bitcoin for quite some time. So was Scaramucci, right? Like very dismissive when the Winklevoss twins told him about it years ago. And then last year he eventually, same thing with Sailor. Took, last year was, I think, a, a pivotal point for these people that have a lot of money or manage a lot of money because it was like, you, you have to do it now, right? Like it, it just became to a point where they just had to do it. So what do you think? Well, you've sat down with Michael. I haven't had an opportunity to have a conversation with him yet. Where Where is he at on the spectrum as to why he's so interested in Bitcoin? Well, I just think that he saw his the the money in his company like a melting ice cube. I mean, there's nowhere you can put it that essentially beats inflation right now that doesn't run a high risk. And the bond yields essentially are negative if you count inflation. So I just think that he was primed to be... I guess, educated on Bitcoin. And we all thank Eric for helping him go down that rabbit hole. And so for him, you know, it's, he's on that, I think that, that, um, extreme scale of, you know, he's, he's wealthy already on his own. He's Mm -hmm. leading a, a company. He can take 
honestly, a massive amount of risk and he has access to a massive amount of capital. It's not so much like the average person, but he gets what it what the problem is with inflation on that like micro level of the average American. And I love his analogies, like the way that he speaks about Bitcoin being like, okay, well, the oxygen's getting sucked out of the room, right? That's inflation. And now this like oxygen mask has dropped out of the sky. Like, wouldn't you put it on? Like, this is, this is a store of value. It's an emerging technology. And based on his experience, you know, he's even written a book about this. It's like, if you bet on the early technology that, a, that has growth potential and has already has already shown that it's pretty successful and pretty reliable, but a lot of people still don't know about it. There's a huge amount of upside. So I just think I think it's just amazing how much conviction he has to do what he has with his company. I'm sure days like today or weeks like this week are not easy with uh, <laughs> people that are on his uh, board for sure. <laughs> but you know, I just think it's it's awesome that we have someone like him, and I hope that other institutions look at MicroStrategy and and adopt the same thing. And I think that people are, they're just not maybe admitting it or, you know, maybe it'll come in, in time when there's a little bit more regular regulatory clarity. Um, so yeah, I just think, I think Michael Saylor's got it and we gotta, we gotta, we gotta get more Michael Saylor's. Hoddle called him the rookie of the year last year. It's so funny. Yeah. Um, but like, honestly, he's had probably a greater impact than really anybody that I, I mean, you could say Max Kaiser probably has, but like in more recent times, I would say Saylor, he's such a good orator. Like he, he explains it so well. Um, and he gets so much access media coverage, right. Which I think helps evangelize, uh, Bitcoin quite a bit, probably better than anybody that I've seen so far, at least mainstream, you know, getting that mainstream, uh, push. And, and hopefully you'll continue to do that and get on, on the TV shows and stuff just like he is. I mean, we need more people doing that. So I think it's great. I got to ask you a couple of cheesy questions if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. (laughs) So, you know, um, what is the one thing that you do a lot of Okay, that you recommend to everybody else? Oh gosh, um, one thing I do a lot of that I recommend: I cook for myself. Well, and the, and you do that just to be healthy, I guess. Yeah. So I grew up, you know, I'm Eastern European. I grew up with a very European family because my parents were, you know, so much older when they came here. So they're not very Americanized. Um, so it's interesting. I feel like I, I live this bicultural life where all of, I, I assimilated into American life very easily because I was so little. So I picked up the language. All my friends became American. Whereas my parents, you know, kept their Polish friends that they communicate with back in Poland and they kept the Polish traditions alive in our house. So, you know, I grew up with my mom and dad cooking, like everything was fresh, wasn't this like idea of microwave dinners and and all of that. So I I have this like love for cooking and I feel like it's a very European thing. Like you just, you make your meal at home. I make homemade pasta. I make homemade everything. So I cook a lot and I think more people should cook and like care about their food and where they come, you know, where their food comes from, but also just this idea of like taking the time. Like, I don't know why people think it's a chore to cook these days. And I have people who they literally, I was in an elevator with a woman and our, my call box was broken in my apartment. And this, so this, so the call box means that an Uber, you know, Postmates or whatever, they can't come up to your floor to drop off your Starbucks or whatever. And so I get in the elevator with this woman and she's so mad that she has to go down the elevator to pick up her, like it was just an elevator ride. But you know, people are ordering Uber like from across the street and it's like, why don't we walk and cook <laughs> anymore? Like, is it that much of a pain for you to go down the elevator or whatever? I just think it's funny. So I would say we should all cook more. <laughs> <laughs> we actually do it. My, my wife's into that too. She's Italian and we, we, we always oh, she's cook Italian. at the house. Yeah, I yeah. used to live in Italy, so hats off to her. <laughs> we don't. I don't. I don't eat any sugar. Um, okay. so I cut that out like two years ago. So I don't have any sugar or alcohol in my diet anymore. Even though I have a bar behind me, <laughs> I don't drink any of it anymore. Um, wow. so but I noticed in like the Bitcoin world, it's like a thing. I didn't. I didn't do it because of Bitcoiners. I, I did it because I had some medical thing. And I was just like cutting sugar wow. out of my diet. But there's like it, there's a lot of like carnivore Bitcoiners. I don't know if you've come across this, but oh yeah, I, it's I interesting, so many, right? I mean, I meet so many carnivores. It's actually something I do. I do like about. All these little things that actually line up with Bitcoin in terms of your belief yeah. systems or it's your so politics weird. <laughs> or your yeah, I mean even the food that you eat. But yeah, it's been interesting to meet people who have these views in line with just like no, not that mass production of food that fiat has sort of created and incentivized. Mm-hmm. Like our our incentive system is so broken in this country, and and it's made our food so unhealthy. And I feel you. I mean, I'm I, people make fun of me because I don't trust American sugar and certain American products mm-hmm. because in Europe. 
Europe, they actually have more strict regulations and like you yeah. can't put certain chemicals in and they're, you know, things are a little bit more um, in terms of like production. It's like smaller farms and all of that. And so I refuse, I won't have sugar in my house. That's not this specific kind of beet sugar. It's made of beets from Poland because it's the only one that I trust won't like mess up my hormonal, you know, system, my endocrine system or something. Well, it's it's important what you put in your body because if you look at like some of these celebrities, they, they, uh, you can't look at my face. I have wrinkles. I'm old. <laughs> but like the, some of them like, you know, J-Lo and stuff. My wife tells me it's Botox, but I think it's a lot of their diet too, to be honest with you. I don't think they're eating unhealthy stuff or processed foods. I think that has a lot to do with it. I, I think it's their diet. I think it's their um, their access to trainers and, you know, the best food in the world. And I also think when you've got that much money, you've got to wake up in the morning and just be like, oh, life's, life's good. <laughs> <laughs> You're less stressed. <laughs> Yeah, we get wrinkles from like financial stress. <laughs> yeah, we're looking at our papers all the time, like <laughs> the bills. Yeah. A couple more questions. So, um, what what is your most productive habit that you have? Tell me. I'm just curious. My most productive habit. Um, I would say like, I'm a big list maker. I'm definitely someone who's very, very organized. And so I just, I like to have a plan. I like to have, a, I know I like to go in knowing what I'm doing. So whether it's, you know, researching for a guest or making sure that I'm, I'm read up on a topic. I just, I like to go in with a plan and, and I like to check things off of lists. I'm one of those people that's like, Oh, my to-do list is sure. done. I feel a little bit more productive and better. How did you get into like all of the, uh, when you got into this space, like how did you navigate your way through with all the influencers and the thought leaders and all that kind of stuff? How did that happen? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I am, my background and my profession has sort of trained me to request interviews and be able to obviously do a long form interview and and research and prepare. And so I think one of the great things about both my my job training but also my personality and just the way that I'm I'm wired is I'm not afraid to ask anyone for an interview or a question and and I do believe like I try to instill in my students that the answers the answer is no if you don't ask, right? Yeah, so, it's guaranteed. Yeah. So my belief is like there's no harm. I mean, I know my intentions. My intentions are to learn and to help others learn, right? That's a that's to me that's a good intention. And so I just I reached out to people. Like people would ask me, you know, early on, like, how did you get this person? How did you get this person? I literally walked up to Michael Saylor backstage at the Bitcoin conference with my dinky little business card. And I was like, I would love to have you on my podcast. Like, I am so, you do so much great work for this space. And I just want to learn from you. And, you know, if you, if you would consider sparing like five minutes, you know, here's my business card. And he said, yes, um, you know, to get safe. Safe, safe is a funny story because I read his book three times. I was obsessed with the Bitcoin standard. And it goes to it goes to what you said about how it's it's a little bit dense and complicated of a book. So I had to reread it because yeah. I was new to all of this and I had no economics background. But I read it and I loved it and I thought he was so brilliant and he was one of my dream interviews. And I could not get a hold of that man. I wrote him so many DMs and so many emails and he just <laughs> ignored all of them. And so I paid the $500 or whatever for his carnivore dinner in Miami at the Bitcoin conference. I'm like, I'm going to meet him and I'm going to beg him to just be on my show because I I'm a good person and he should talk to me. And I walked up to him and I'm like, please, like I love your book. Please come on my show. And he said, yeah. So, you know, I'm I guess I'm tenacious in that way. You know, as as a reporter, I would have to knock on doors of people on their worst day, right? They just lost a baby. They're going through something horrible. They're accused of a crime. And I had to knock on that door because God forbid another reporter did and yeah. they get it on their news station and, and my boss is like, where is it? So I would have to put myself in really uncomfortable positions and I grew comfortable with the discomfort, I guess. Like I have no shame asking anybody for an interview. I, I've I've tried to reach out to Elon Musk. Okay, no response yet, nice. but like, I will keep asking. Uh, you know, I... I um I know Jaramucci, and so he introduced me to uh, Michael Saylor on an email. Ghost. <laughs> no response. I said back to Anthony, I go, did you send it to the right person? He's like, 100%. Just because he's not interested. I was like, oh, man, that's embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the case. I mean, like some of these guys are busy, and they're like, well, I don't see the benefit in going on that show. Didn't care. You know? They're just dismissive. It's hard, man. It's really hard. And like to your point, sometimes you have to just go right up in person. To, and I'm not like, I'm not going to go tra track them down. So if I hit you in an email and you want to come on the show, that's cool. I'd like to do the interview with these people. But if not, I'm not going to find you. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I, and you know, I'm, I will keep trying. I mean, I've been told no, and that's not, to me, that's not a forever no. <laughs> so 
Uh, so yeah, no, it is, it's really hard to get some interviews and yeah. I think it's really important to be persistent, especially in, in, in this role. Um, uh, so, but it does, sometimes it requires the person to know that you're a human being and know that you don't have some crazy, you know, agenda behind you because right now it is really crazy with media. And I do try to remember, you know, it's, it's not easy to put yourself out there on screen because it lives mm -hmm. forever today. Mm -hmm. And, um, like there is, you know, there are people who I will not name names, but there are people who are bigger personalities who I've tried to speak to about Bitcoin in this kind of setting where either I go on their show or they come on mine. But my goal is to like tell them why based on their belief system, they would love Bitcoin. And their teams have sometimes come back to me and said, they don't know enough and they don't want to seem uneducated. So sure. they come on a show and they are asking these questions. They appear dumb on this subject. And so we're not ready to do that, which is a bummer. Uh, but I get it. You know, it's, it takes some guts to be able to go on a show and start to have these conversations. And, uh, I think, I think it'll happen, you know, more and more as the space continues to grow. Yeah. Like I, I had one of my old angel investors was Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, and I wanted him to come on my show and he didn't even respond. So I wrote him another email again, bro, come on, you know, you're ignoring me. And he's like, he's like, I'm so busy with masters of scale, which is his own podcast. I'm on lots of boards, this and that with the family. He's like, it's not a forever no, he basically said in a different way. But but it's tough. I mean, even people you're friendly with that you know, you can't get everybody, right? So it's it is a tough, it is tough. Um, why are we doing this? I think it's important to try to get the word out to your point, like yeah. the education. I, I think it's really if you have access and you can get these people, then more of these shows are better, I think, because it's more repetitive for people to catch it at some point. So well, and um, the funny thing too is now, I mean, think about how many people have a podcast. I mean, I'm being yeah. asked. I had one most, 10 years ago, by the way. But yeah. yeah. I mean, everyone has a podcast, right? So these people must be flooded inundated with requests. Uh, because everyone, I mean, here in LA. That's what like, Naval said to me. He's like, I get requests every day, okay. literally every day. Yeah. He said, I was like, oh geez. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm shocked, honestly. Like when I started coin stories, I had 2000 followers on Twitter. I published it the week of the Bitcoin conference and no, like, I don't even know why half of these people said yes to me. I, I have no idea. So. It's difficult, but it's fun. I, I enjoy doing this. And I enjoyed the interview with you today. I just want to thank you for coming on my show. Thank you very much, Natalie. I appreciate you spending time with me today and sharing your origin story. Thanks so much for having me. This is fun. Cool. Everybody, Natalie Brunel.